Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, New Pacific 3 Eastern, Sunday 3 Pacific 6 Eastern. Monday here on this program, you know what that means we got a lot to get into here today. As last night, AW Revolution pay-per-view. And overall, it's an awesome pay-per-view. Five matches on the main show that one could argue was the best match of the night. And it really all depends on what do you like in your pro wrestling? You like a straightforward, old-school pro wrestling world championship match? You got that? You want a violent, bloody, thumbtacks, chains? You got that? You want two dudes absolutely just pounding each other into utter oblivion? Well, you certainly got that. You had the... You had the... uh, Young Bucks-style, crazy tag team, high-spot match. And uh, you ever watch an old-school Japanese pro-wrestling battle from the 80s? You got that in the opener. So whatever your cup of tea is, the amazing thing is not only did you get it, but I think you got more than you bargained for in virtually every case. I was so excited for Kingston and Jericho. I was so excited for... Like a lot of these matches, but that one and the Moxley-Danielson match were the two that I was most excited for. And incredibly, they were both better. Like, I had an idea in my brain of what I wanted to see, and both of them were better. So anyway, we could talk about that show here today. There was a lot of fallout. There were angles on the show. There were no title changes, but they did a couple of things, particularly in the Britt Baker match, which uh, certainly do appear to be leading towards a title change, one would think. So we'll tell you about that. And, of course, Dynamite and Rampage coming up. And uh, Raw tonight, we've got four segments announced for the show. We have uh, more matches for WrestleMania, when you can expect them, plus some WrestleMania updates and uh, so much more. So stick around. A lot to get into after the break. Wrestling Observer Live. Man, i got to get off this chat. So Holy smokes. Twitch going. or YouTube? It's actually mostly this Jingu fella. I'm sure he's a nice guy and all, but man, one Twitch. one take after another. Uh, all right, so let's get into uh, the pay-per-view last night. Uh, there were 12 matches on the show, and uh, it was an excellent show overall. I did not see all of Layla Hirsch and Chris Statlander. What I saw wasn't that great, but uh, I'll leave that to someone else to review. Hook and QT was absolutely positively exactly what you would expect, and uh, it was five minutes, and it was perfect. Match of the night? Of course not. But it was uh, Hook going in there, selling a little, killing QT. Everybody was happy, and that's what you need to do. House of Black versus Death Triangle was, like, any other show, this would have gotten, you know, votes for best match of the night. But because it was the pre-show, and there were five match of the night contenders on the main show, uh, no one's really talking about it, but it was an excellent match. And everybody looked good. I don't know if Eric Redbeard's coming back, but uh, they beat him in the end. And it looked like it was kind of just, you know, he was there until, uh, until, uh, um, what's his name comes back? Phoenix. But we'll see. I think he deserves a job. I like this Vintner. I don't know if you're aware or not. Eddie Kingston beat Chris Jericho in a freaking great match. (sighs) I mean, I would not honestly be surprised if that actually won the poll for best match of the night because it was absolutely in the running and it had the best heat of any of the other matches on the show because they got the opening, uh, the opener spot. And uh, for 13 minutes and 40 seconds, they just had an old school Japanese pro wrestling match. Eddie Kingston beat him with a stretch plum. But then Jericho refused to shake his hand as he had promised and he walked off. So thank God there's more to come in this feud. Jurassic Express beat Red Dragon and the Young Bucks. Uh, Complicated match, simple story. Two heel teams, guess what? They couldn't coexist. And as a result, the Jurassic Express actually had the advantage, and they got the win, and Red Dragon and the Young Bucks continue to implode, which I'm sure will continue on as Adam Cole also didn't win the title in the main event. Wardlow won the face of the Revolution ladder match, which, as of today, far as I know... Of all the matches and all the spots, the only person who suffered what would uh, be a... We don't know the severity yet, but Orange Cassidy got thrown like a crazy person, overshot the target, injured his shoulder. He needs an MRI. Amazingly, nobody else on this entire show was hurt, including Ricky Starks, 
who got power bombed onto a ladder, leading to Wardlow climbing up and grabbing the brass ring. He gets a shot at the TNT title. Jade Cargill beat Ty Conti. They only gave him six minutes, which, you know, shouldn't have been longer. I can tell you that much. It was not a terrible match. It was not a great match. They made it through, I think is the uh, the best way to put it. Fans are very forgiving because they love Jade Cargill. I mean, she is a star to them. And she beat Ty Conti to retain the title. CM Punk MJF, brutal, violent, dog collar match, double juice, uh, thumbtacks. And finally, MJF called out Wardlow for the ring. But Wardlow couldn't find the ring. MGF was distracted by this. He ate the GTS onto the thumbtacks. And then, guess what? I found the ring! Wardlow put it on the ring apron. CM Punk took the ring. He punched MGF and he pinned him to win. Two-year storyline. MGF and Wardlow have broken up. And from the feedback I received and saw on social media, if you were watching this in a theater or a bar, Wardlow finding that damn ring was the biggest pop of the entire evening, which is what you want for a storyline that has spanned two years. Britt Baker beat Thunder Rosa. Bullet Club booking by Ghetto here. Interference, 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 distraction, visual pin, interference, interference. And here's what I will say about this, okay? Because I know a lot of people hated it. And Unlike believe me, it, booking, it's going somewhere. I am not af- I am not afraid to say that there was too much interference, but there's a difference here. Mm-hmm. WWE, you see this all the time because they don't want to beat somebody. And then that's just the shit. That's it. There's no like, oh, it's leading to this or that. Or often it'll like lead to something that makes no sense. Like, hey, you know, we're going to do a bunch of interference and it's going to lead to a wrestling match. Well, they did all of that because, and I, I can't see this 100%, but looking at a match they have on Wednesday, and a location for a match in two weeks. I believe that this is leading to Thunder Rosa versus Britt Baker in a steel cage match in Thunder Rosa's hometown, I think even on her birthday, where Thunder Rosa is going to defeat Britt Baker and win the AEW women's title. So, yeah, you can hate it if you want, but there was a reason they booked it the way that they did. And we're going to get that payoff, I think, in... uh, I think it's March 14th. I think it's St. Patrick's Day. Darby Allin, Sammy, and Sting beat Andrade, Matt Hardy, and Isaiah Cassidy. I believe the whole point of this was Matt Hardy took the L. He apologized. I expect him to take another L. I expect the Hardy family office to turn on him. And I expect his brother, Jeff Hardy, to make the save. And the Hardy boys reunite as baby faces. So we'll see if that happens. Moxley and Brian Danielson. So... This was like the freaking best match. And, bro, they just went in there. And I I don't know. I haven't talked to either guy. But my assumption is they went in there with pretty much nothing. And they just had an old school call in the ring, beat the living hell out of each other, kick each other to the point where I'm sure both of them probably needed assistance to get out of bed this morning. But my God, was it fantastic. And uh, John Moxley beat him with a cradle reversing a triangle. They got in a big fight afterwards because they're two dudes that are just prideful and violent. And who should come out to headbutt and slap sense into them but William Regal? Bro, I've said a million times, I look at all these AEW shows and they're, they're extremely competently booked. As you can see by Tony Khan winning Best Booker two years straight now. And I always try and figure out like where they're going and what they're doing and whatever. And I figured Moxie was winning this match because the story was he'd never beaten Brian Danielson. And Danielson said, I got to bleed with a guy before I team with him. So I knew there would be blood and I knew there would be violence. So it was like everything I knew was going to happen. But I did not. I did not think that they were going to continue fighting afterwards. And William Regal... Lord Regal would come out, slap and headbutt sent to them, put them on the same page, and they'd shake hands. It was like a thousand times better than I would have imagined. And uh, I have a friend, by the way, if you love this match, I have a buddy who uh, who texted me, you know, that this was like just the greatest match he ever saw in his life. And then this morning he texted me, he said, I can't believe I'm saying this, 
but this might be the second best match I saw this weekend. And I said, that's impossible! And then he explained that the other match was Ishii and Shingo. And I thought, my God, he might be right. So I got to watch that match. Holy smokes. If he thought that match was like maybe better than Moxley and Danielson, I just don't know if that's possible. But if there's a match, if there is a match that could be better than this one, I can believe that that would be the match. And finally, Adam Page beat Adam Cole in an uh, excellent world title match. You know, it, the fans were tired. They were doing joke chants. Let's go, Adam. Adam sucks. <laughs> but hey, at least it was heat. That was, but then, yeah. the longer this went, it stopped being joke chants, and it turned into Hangman and Adam Cole chants. And man, they loved him some Adam Cole, because when Hangman Page got revenge for being duct taped to the ropes, and he tied Adam Cole to the ropes with his belt and started super kicking, the fans turned on the Hangman! I don't think they were expecting that. But he uh, got the win, retained the title. Bro, this man, this show, I mean, it wasn't perfect. But my God, was it fantastic. Mike's going to give his thoughts after the break, everybody. Because we have a break coming up, according to my mm -hmm. calculations. It's true. And we'll get into more afterwards. Back in a moment, Observer Live. What do you think of this show, Michael? I think it was the best AEW show there's ever been. Wow. I, I, I dare say that. I know Full Gear and... Last year's All Out. There have been some really good shows, but I thought top to bottom, this was pretty amazing for a 12-match show. And I come from that old New Japan stead where a five-hour show quarterly isn't going to hurt my feelings. Not at all. Not Especially not with the variety that this show had. I understand. Look, I'll take six shows a year that are paired back a little bit. I'm not going to complain about that. I am an old man, but with them only running four shows a year at this level, I completely understand why they did what they did. And I thought they offered so much variety. I don't think anybody could complain about it. I thought Layla Hirsch, Chris Statlander, it was good. It was solid. It was uh, finishing off telling that little story that they've had between the two. I thought it was, you know, in another era, they would have a super show start off like this with a 10-minute draw. I'll take a 9-minute and 50-second victory over Layla Hirsch, and I don't know what's going to happen with Lord Regal, but if you wanted to add a woman into the mix as far as giving her something that stands out, boy, I think Layla Hirsch uh, around a group like that would work out very nicely. Thing was, of the 12 matches, by far the 12th best match on the show. Hook and QT Marshall, you know, that was awesome for what it was. I would have actually, I thought they were going to end uh, the, the pre-show with that. I thought that would have been a perfect way to go off the air with everybody going nuts after him crushing QT. But then again, how they did it with the... Alt Universe Varsity Club of Malachi Black, Brody King, and Buddy Matthews. I mean, they're tremendous. They, they really are. And there are so many things you could do with them. And because it's not WWE, the odds of them sticking together as a group for a significant period of time is great. And I would love to see what they decide to do with them. Eric Redbeard. Look, if you want to give him a job, it's not going to hurt my feelings, not my money. Have no problem with him being on the roster whatsoever and in the mix. But if you don't want to, I do like the idea of bringing him in every once in a while. If it has something to do with the Dark Order, if it now has something to do with the, the uh, Death Triangle, if it's got something to do with that, bring him in. You know, as a regular basis, they got a lot of people anyway. I don't know if he fits, but hey, I'm down for anything. Then you get to the main roster, and it was just, it was ridiculous. Eddie Kingston and Chris Jericho. I don't know if Jericho, being a veteran, looked at this card and said, you know what? Let's get out there early. Everybody else is going to try to steal the show. We'd like to, too. I want to open up this show with this crowd being as fresh as possible. And he goes out there and gets thrown in that half and half by Eddie Kingston. Lands on his head. I mean, what a hell of a way to start the show. How he sold that and then it was off to the races. That was great. I thought the tag match was great. Is Wardlow winning is what it was supposed to be with that ladder match, and I'm cool with the ladder match. I, they have got to get rid of the brass ring. I think a or GCW needs to get rid of it. Everybody else that does a takeoff of the ring, 
there's got to be another way. There's got to be a different thing that you can put up there for them to grab. I think it looks so cheap. It looks so cheesy. It's like, you know, here's his crowning moment. Well, the second crowning moment of the night for him, ultimately at the end. And he's standing up there holding a big gold glazed donut. I, I didn't like it whatsoever. Jade Cargill's a superstar. That match was perfect to have on there. Anna Jay was a perfect person with enough name value for Jade to beat. On the main show, you know, another short match, you know, that people won't complain about whatsoever. Cargill's a star. She can only go up from here. CM Punk MJF was probably my match of the night. I thought it was absolutely outstanding. Britt Baker, as you mentioned, with Thunder Rosa. That, to me, is building towards Thunder Rosa winning that title somewhere else. Moxley and Danielson, if you want to call it the match of the night, I'm not going to complain about that either. Just a incredible showing between those two guys going all out, doing what they wanted to do when they left WWE. I'm not saying it's the pinnacle for these two guys because God knows where they can go from here, but I thought that was wonderful. And with Lord Regal coming out there at the end, the odds that you're going to have a group with Moriarty and Yuta and Garcia, you know, that's looking like it could come more to pass. Sting? I remember watching Sting in 1986 when I was 10 years old. Last night, I woke up too early on Sunday, so I fell asleep during the pay-per-view. My old ass at 46 years old, just turned 46 years old. Meanwhile, 63-year-old Sting, as he's about to be in a couple of weeks here, he is doing dives through tables. It was just an absolutely unbelievable performance. The video package they had, and this is a, another thing when it comes to video packages, in 2022, less is more. The less you do them, the more they mean, especially when they're as unique as what you had there with Darby Allen, Sting, and, and, and that stuff before the match. I thought that was incredible. One thing you didn't mention, Swerve. Signing his contract, coming out there. Will he be a babyface? Will he be a heel? I don't know, but I know for a fact he's a heel in Defy, and that match with with uh, Nick Wayne is up for free. So if you're looking for something else to watch that took place last weekend that just went up, that's another thing you might want to watch because that was awesome. And then Hangman Page and Adam Cole, I was not a big fan of the build leading into the thing. All that goes out the window once the bell rings. Very good performance by Hangman Adam Page again. Adam Cole, not dead by any means. Got to figure out what you want to do with him in this whole realm going on that you have with the Elite and the Bullet Club and all these other factions and everything else going on. I think he needs now it's time to rebuild him up nicely to get him back at a, a level that I, I don't think that he's at right now, even though he had a hell of a match with Hangman Adam Page. So that's enough out of me. I thought it was a hell, a hell of a night for them. And I think ultimately up and down, they may have had quote-unquote better matches maybe on other shows, especially the, with the shows that Kenny Omega was on. But I'd say from top to bottom, I think this was their best showing by far. I don't know if you guys are aware of this or not, but I am a feature writer for Sports Illustrated, and I've got a new article coming out here today. You'll be able to find it on my Twitter at Brian Alvarez. But I couldn't help but note in that article that on the weekend that AEW did this fantastic show, WWE also ran Madison Square Garden. You guys remember this story? Hmm. Well, you know, I remember this story. So what happened was uh, WWE, you know, Madison Square Garden, it's their, uh, it's their uh, you know, their mecca. And they hadn't been drawn all that great. And so they wanted to make sure for this Madison Square Garden show that they did huge business. And so what did they do to build up this show, everybody? Well, they went on television, and they actually promoted a house show. They actually talked about MSG this Saturday. And they said, you know what? Everybody's expecting that Lesnar versus Roman Reigns is going to be a champion versus champion, title for title match at WrestleMania, the biggest match since Warrior and Hogan. But it might not be title for title because... This Saturday, they said, at Madison Square Garden, Brock Lesnar might lose that championship belt to a mystery opponent. They built it up, and they built it up. It was literally, they did... they did A, a worthy opponent, most, too. Remember Paul Heyman said a worthy opponent. Their most watched segments with Lesnar and Reigns, they kept talking about this match and this storyline. And if you... 
if you heard about Madison Square Garden, well, what happened was they had a Roman Reigns championship defense, which was funny because they they actually uh, announced it would be Roman Reigns versus Seth Rollins. And then they pulled the advertising, but it ended up being Roman Reigns versus Seth Rollins. So I actually, I don't know, like there's two options here. One, they're incompetent and they were they, they changed their mind, but then rechanged it back to the original. Or the other thing is, well, man, if we tell people Seth Rollins, like, you know. So let's not say who it is and maybe people will think it's like someone else and they'll buy a ticket, you know. Cody. What was Seth Rollins? And uh, then the match was like three minutes. It was just like a nothing happened in match. So, you know, we heard from people there that they were disappointed with that. And then it's time for the big main event that they've been building up on television. Who is going to come out the worthy opponent to challenge and perhaps beat Brock Lesnar to screw up all of the WrestleMania champion versus Austin Theory? Not Cody? Austin Theory was the big surprise. And you'll never guess what happened in the match. Brock what just happened? brutalized and killed the guy and beat him. Oh, man. So, I mean, I, I mean, I, I was just thinking about this, and it's like, okay, so let's let's forget this show, okay? Let's go back to the last time you did Madison Square Garden and you didn't draw very well. Why was that? A bunch of matches nobody wanted to see? Uh, lack of stars? Just, you know, why why didn't you draw? Okay, so now you have an idea. You're going to draw this time. Which, by the way, I, I don't have the... I'm trying to find the exact numbers, but they didn't draw all that well, even with all the promotion. So this time, you're going you're gonna to try to get people in that may not have wanted to go in the first place. You're going to say, you know what? If you weren't thinking of going, well, you should think about going because we're going to promote it on television and we're going to have a special secret opponent for Brock Lesnar that could screw up all of the uh, on-storyline plans for, for WrestleMania. So you went to the trouble to do that, to try to sell tickets, to boost your image in Madison Square Garden, to get people that weren't thinking of going to go... And that was what you gave them. That was what you delivered. Austin Theory against Brock Lesnar in the main event. So the point of all of this is, I watched that AEW pay-per-view, and they they uh, they promised me a lot of stuff. And was there one thing on that show where you got less than you expected? Was there one thing on that show where you got less than you expected? Because I watched that show, and one match after another... I got more than I expected. I got angles. I got surprise debuts. I got matches that were better than I expected going in. It was amazing to see the contrast between what WWE did for Madison Square Garden and what AEW did for their Revolution pay-per-view. Mike Sots after the break, Observer Live. So I uh, just want to mention very quickly that uh, the final number of tickets distributed for the MSG show was uh, 8,700. That's distributed. So the number of tickets that they actually sold to wrestling fans was under 8,700. So overall, they were, uh, with all that promotion on television and all of the promises and angles on TV for the house show, they were up 22% from December. And that extra 22% that, uh, you know, paid their money, yeah. See what happens next time they do MSG. Thoughts on this, Mike? Well, if I'm considering the record at MSG and the last time around we were going back to the 30s to talk about some of the times that they have drawn less paid attendance, I have a feeling they're not going back to the Garden anytime soon. Now, when they go back to The Rock or to Barclays or out to the island, that might be a different story, but I I, I don't know. I, I have a feeling... For the next garden, I would assume that they will probably be six months from now and they probably will have a much better plan going into it, or at least I'd like to hope so. But remember how we were talking about that whole deal with the WWE schedule? And I said, I know somewhere I have one of those pay-per-view flyers that they used to send out back in the day to hype all of these events. Remember that? Yeah. Well, guess what? I found one, and it's from... 2001, finally, The Rock, SummerSlam here from Comcast. These would be the things that they would send out, WWF Fanatic Series that they would have on pay-per-view. 
the best of WWF all month long. August, Hard Knocks and Cheap Pops. September, Divas and Hedonism. Boy, Trish Stratus is nice, isn't she? Anyway, and, and somehow, amazingly, actually not somehow, she just has gotten better looking as she has gotten older. But then again, doesn't matter right now. What matters is there was an actual schedule that they did have, an entire calendar. Now, unfortunately, no, you know, you'd, you'd have to go to the Observer to you're, actually you're pick up. up. You'd have to go to the Observer to actually get the cities that they were going to be in. Wow. But on this right here, as you see, starting with Unforgiven on September 22nd, 2001, we will scroll up and we have a whole set of shows leading in to SummerSlam coming up August 25th, 2002. So so uh, that's from, what, 2001, you're telling that's me? Well, 2000, 2001, uh, yeah. yeah. Anyone have uh, uh, Nick Khan's email? Because I want to make sure I send him that poster. Mm. So whoever convinced him that they didn't announce shows in advance and that this was a revolutionary concept that would turn the business around? Somebody call this line. I got, a, I got a bridge out Let's back. See. Made of gold, I see might somebody, add. See if somebody will actually respond to it's that for number. Sale. But uh, you only get the deed. Anyway, a uh, couple of notes. Raw tonight. Edge will address his attack on AJ from last week. The Miz and Logan Paul will throw a homecoming celebration. Jerry Lawler will make a special guest appearance. <laughs> and uh, Alpha Academy will defend against RK Bro and Seth Rollins and Kevin Owens, who are number one contenders. But only in three-way matches. Okay. Then we got uh, WrestleMania lineup. So for those of you that haven't bought your tickets yet, but after that MSG show, you're clamoring to get a WrestleMania ticket. We got uh, night one, Saturday, April 2nd. Charlotte versus Ronda Rousey. Becky Lynch versus Bianca. Ray and Dominic versus Miz and Logan Paul. And Drew McIntyre will face Happy Corbin. Night two, we have Roman Reigns versus Brock Lesnar. Pat McAfee versus Austin Theory, and Sami Zayn versus Johnny Knoxville. For those of you that are all on the, oh, Dave was wrong, Vince McMahon was not going to be on uh, uh. Well, the uh, lineup for WrestleMania internally listed Vince McMahon versus Pat McAfee. So if you're mad, like, don't be mad at Dave. Mad at whoever was running that copy machine. But the point of this <laughs> is, although well. at this point it is... Austin Theory versus Pat McAfee. There's weeks to go before WrestleMania. I'll and, just put and that's, it that way. That's the, I would say it's within the realm of possibility that it was not going to be Vince in the match, but it's going to be somebody representing Vince, whether that be Austin Theory, whether they have... Say Steve Austin decides I'm out or whatever it's going to be. Maybe you need something for Kevin Owens. Whatever the deal is going to be, maybe it wasn't actually going to be Vince wrestling, but obviously it's going to have something to do with Vince. It just for Austin Theory, and again, we're not going to get into this topic because I tend to fall more on your side, but for everybody out there that says, well, tell me you know, how you can't screw up Braun Breaker or how you can screw up Braun Breaker. Here's how you do it. You send him with Vince backstage where you have him go in these ridiculous promo sessions and have ridiculous interactions and have Vince tell uh, Braun Breaker that you know if he does something wrong, he's going to tell his mother and go after his mother or whatever it was that he told Austin Theory. So, yeah, I mean, we're seeing it with Theory right now. This is amazing, and I'm sure they're saying he's getting a rub by getting F5'd in every which way by Brock Lesnar, but it's not, and we're not seeing this guy develop in the way that we know he can and how he should because we've seen him throughout his entire career up to this point, and it's like the only thing that's retarded the process so far is actually sitting next to Vince McMahon, well, the star yes, maker. But uh, I watch NXT 2.0, and this guy's been a geek from day one. He was Johnny Gargano's son. His son! I know. But when they yeah, look, and when they brought him up, and they were going to do he got the deal grounded. Where, look where he was going. I know, and when he was going to be an acolyte of of uh, Seth Rollins, remember that short second that he was going to do that? I thought that was a terrible idea too. I just and you just see how they fumble over and over, and I just I don't get it. I just don't understand. So anyway, uh, Steve Austin may or may not be doing a match at WrestleMania. But he is, at this point, still going to be there, and he is still going to do something with Kevin Owens. So, you know, they they won a match, and uh, 
We'll They're see. drinking beer, that's for sure. I mean, here's the thing, everybody. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Owens is getting stunned. Okay? <laughs> so, if we want to be semantic about this, there's either going to be like a segment that leads to a short brawl and Kevin Owens gets stunned, or we're going to have a short match and Kevin Owens gets stunned. So, like, if you're really going to be all up in arms about it, well, well, you know, they brawled for three minutes and then it was a stunner, but they didn't ring the bell, so uh, he didn't wrestle. Or, yeah, they wrestled for three minutes and he stunned it. Bro, that, you're going to get one or the other, okay? They're not going to do – I'll tell you this for sure. They ain't going 15 minutes. They ain't going <laughs> no. 17 minutes, okay? If Steve Austin does a match, it's going to be a, a relatively short match. I'm not saying it's going to be like 10 seconds, but it's going to be on the shorter end – and it's going to end with a stunner. Or there's going to be a segment that leads to a brawl, and there's going to be a stunner. So yeah. you can get one or the other. Oh, how about this? You get a brawl, and Kevin Owens is saying, you don't have any guts to actually face me in a match. You're going to show up, and fine, you, you've been scared to face me. You're scared to come back. And then Steve Austin goes, well, hell, kid, you know, hit, hit the bell. And then he gives him a stunner and pins him, and then three-second match, pours the beard, and nobody gives a crap because they saw Steve Austin and Kevin Owens, and everybody's happy. You know, especially know who's really going to be happy. That's going to be Kevin Owens. So everybody would be a winner in that exchange no matter what they do as long as steve austin shows up and i know they have not promoted him they haven't mentioned him it's all on the fans for hyping this up but the reality is damn it you're in texas how can you have a texas wrestlemania without stone cold steve austin and the way this is going with kevin owens who else is it going to be it ain't going to be kevin von eric who is going to save texas all right gary hart dead and even if he was alive he would be making fun of texas there's no dick murdoch there's no dusty roads who is going to take up for texas if not for stone cold steve austin all right uh notes from the press conference last night tony khan does plan to continue Ring of Honor's wrestling operations after acquiring the company. And it says he will serve as the booker. So I'm not sure what that means for Delirious. I mean, is this going to be Tony Khan as Vince McMahon and Delirious is, you know, Shawn Michaels or whoever? In the sense that, uh, you know, Tony will give him the overall picture and he does the day-by-day? Or is he not going to be employed? I don't well, know. I was right going to ask about that. I mean, everybody has been released, right? Do we even know if Delirious is employed? He is employed. Because he was he was in charge of uh, doing a lot of the stuff that they were doing on television in the meantime. So, Aye. yeah, he was. Uh, they just got rid of all of the. Uh... Well, and look, and, and I know people are going. Well, he can't do this sort of thing, and I know there's a lot on his plate as it is, and it's like you know, the more, frankly, looking at this from a sports point of view, the more he can get out of football and and proper football, and the more he invests himself in wrestling, that might be the best thing for him and everybody else anyway. And if Ring of Honor is only going to run a couple of weekends, or you know, there it's going to be a slow motion process to get the thing jump started and kick started. You know, who knows? Uh, again, I, I'm i not super sour on that, although it's a lot on his plate. But if he, again, uh, we'll just have to see how things play out. It's so early right now. We have no idea what direction things are going to go. All righty. What else do we have here today? Rampage. Different time slot later this month. Friday, March 18th, 1130 p.m. Eastern. There'll be the... Four first round NCAA men's basketball tournaments on TNT that day. First one starting at one twenty Eastern. Last one scheduled to tip off at nine at twenty Eastern. So they'll be out of their normal Oof. time slot. Which uh, last time they were out of their normal time slot, they actually did better in eighteen to forty nine, but worse in viewers. Th- that game and those games tend to sometimes they'll go late. <laughs> so just check your DVR and if you have an older DVR too that doesn't catch up or has got some sort of issue or something like that, make sure you extend out the time. MSG uh, Gate six hundred thousand was the number, by the way, for all of that work. Six hundred thousand mm. dollars. Guys, know that uh, the Double or Nothing show is broken a million. Show coming up in uh, May. Tickets just went on sale a couple days ago. Huh. Where's that show at, though? It's in Las Vegas. Yeah. The show was in Madison Square Garden, and tickets were ungodly high. Well, they were. They did $600,000 yeah. gate. Well, look, Dave, the last time around, they were in that middle of running things way too much, and then because the, they just added shows on top of shows, and 
Look, I their philosophy with the garden, it does not mean what it once did. And it kills me to say it a little bit because, you know, but look, it's like for boxing. It's just not the mecca for that stuff anymore. I still love the building. So I love seeing the Knicks and the Rangers in it. But for as far as wrestling goes, I mean, Barclays is really their spot. And again, I have a feeling the next time they go back to the garden, they're going to have to give people a reason to go. And they're going to have to give people a reason for those ticket prices, because otherwise there's a hell of a lot of other things you can do on a Saturday night in Manhattan. The WWE Hall of Fame joins The Undertaker, as the other inductee already announced. Passed away in 2018 at the age of 63. Won Most Improved 1999 in the Observer Awards. And uh, one of the great big men of all time in wrestling. So Vader's going into the WWE Hall of Fame. Shame. Uh, well, you know, I shouldn't say that. Maybe there were some things I'm not privy to, but I know he was one of those guys where there were a lot of people, including himself, that really wanted to see him get in when he was still alive. And unfortunately, that's not the case now. And they go ahead and they make the move. So hopefully they get somebody who is familiar with him and his career to actually give him a proper good induction. Touch on his stuff in Japan. Touch on his time in the AWA, in Germany, all these other places where this guy was a true legendary international star. Uh, I mean, of the highest order, he really, really is. And Kerry Silkin has been honored as part of the promotion's inaugural Hall of Fame class. Kerry Silkin, on a special Hall of Fame edition of ROH TV that aired this weekend, was presented with the first ever Ring of Honor Hall of Fame Legacy Award. The award will be known as the Kerry Silkin Legacy Award going forward. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. Come. A couple of notes about an hour from now to Pacific 5 Eastern, myself and Filthy Tom Lawler. Smackdown, New Japan, strong and more. That'll Did be... you get your shirt? Get my shirt? Yeah, the shirts came in. Filthy Tom Lawler shirts. I didn't get a shirt. What, you didn't buy a shirt to support him and try to get him into the G1, Brian? You didn't buy a shirt from Filthy Tom Lawler? You don't have a shirt that says, to Brian Alvarez? From filthy to stay filthy? You don't have this? How do you not have this? Everybody should have this. They should go to New Japan Shop right now. NJPW1972.com. Follow them on Twitter. Find out where you can get a filthy Tom Lawler shirt. You should have one of these. Anyway, he'll be on in an hour, and uh, he can plug his own stuff. And then uh, tomorrow, we got a very special show, which is so special that it will be airing on both Twitch and YouTube, only for subscribers. If you're a Twitch homie or a YouTube subscriber, you can watch it live at 9 Pacific, midnight Eastern, tomorrow night. The Ode to Rob Bartlett edition of the Brian and Vinny Show as it is his final show. We've been watching the Retro Raws from Episode 1. We are now at Episode 13, Unlucky 13 for Rob Bartlett. This final ever show. We got songs coming in. Ode to Rob Bartlett songs. You can send those. 30 seconds or less, MP3. 30 seconds or less, MP3. To Brian at WrestlingObserver.com. We got poetry. We're going to review Raw 13. It's going to be so much fun. Live for paying Twitch homies and uh, paying YouTube top tier subscribers. That's tomorrow night. And uh, Lance Storm tomorrow afternoon as well. We'll get his thoughts on uh, everything going on with MJF and CM Punk. Follow up everyone's waiting for. It's coming up tomorrow, everybody. A lot to get into. We'll talk to you again next time. Thanks, Mike, as always. Callers and listeners. Everybody in the studio. Wrestling.